thank you, Dr. Lucas Dirks, for this uh, interview and this chat we're having today. Um, you have created several models that came from social psychology and your background in many things like arts. And you started with something called social panoramas. So how did that start? Yeah, that started while I was writing a book and I was writing a chapter on uh, hierarchies and categories. And the book was about NLP. Mm -hmm. and, and then when I was uh, working on this subject, I suddenly thought, hey, hierarchies and categories, that's what we do in social life. Mm -hmm. We place people above ourselves or make people more important. And we categorize people. And um, now most of our troubles have to do with that <laughs> in, <laughs> in the world. And so... Uh, would it be that the conclusion from that chapter had that uh, hierarchy and categories are produced in the mind by, you could say, submodality differences, mm -hmm. differences in submodality, could it also be the truth for social life? And, and then very soon, I recognized that location, which was already recognized by Robert Dills and others as a and Richard Bendler is a primary submodality, is a very important submodality that's always there, that that would be decisive in how we organize our social model of the world. And, and, and that's, that's what my conclusion was. And then I started to experiment with that. And yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> and, then, and that's about uh, uh, 26 years ago or so. Wow. So if we want to go deeper into that, hierarchies and categories, so it's like different categories and different hierarchies within them, or is it uh, like how different hierarchies exist in like a, a specific social space? Well, uh, when you uh, have a client and the client complains about their boss being very authoritarian mm -hmm. and they need to obey and they don't want to obey baby, but there's an issue with that boss, then it's uh, guaranteed that when you ask them, okay, point out with your hand, where is your boss in your mind? When you sense this uh, submission or when you sense uh, this authority, then they point up somewhere. Uh, so and maybe in front. And, and then when you ask for more details, you will notice that the image of the boss is high up, looking down on them. Mm -hmm. now, the opposite is also when you have their boss uh, as a client, hey, you could be lucky that you have a boss and a co-worker and that the boss complains about these boys, they don't do what I tell them. And, so, and then when you ask him, okay, go to the feeling of maybe your disregard for this uh, co-worker, uh, and point out where do you see him? He may point down, yeah? so he may let's see what I can do. He may point down, and so and um, and then when you explore that, you find that he sees this um, uh, uh, person that he sees as uh, as uh, lower in rank or, or lower in power or lower in. Uh, uh, esteem than himself down now so this is this is something that that you can find very easily that you can find it everywhere so it was like a law of nature and and so then i found that in any culture uh, so i i have not seen all cultures but i visit many countries in the world where i teach the social panorama there was no exception to that higher in hierarchy, uh, in experienced hierarchy, is higher uh, than you yourself, uh, so that the eyes are often seen above your own eye level mm -hmm. and, um, and the opposite. Now, so that is, that is where you could say, how are social psychological hierarchies created mm -hmm. in the vertical dimension? Okay. Now, then when it comes to categories, uh, so you could say, okay, uh, how do I think of the uh, Lebanese? Uh, so the Lebanese. Now, then 
then there can be hierarchy. So I can be looking looking up to them. Yeah? So tough, smart people with a long history and uh, etc. Uh, so that could be the case, but it could be also that I see them as, as a sort of cluster somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe at uh, two meters away uh, and then, um, yeah, looking in a certain direction. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's them. So in the social panorama, I could have categories in space, like the Lebanese, right. the, the Dutch, the Germans, the Brazilians, in different directions and different heights. Right. Uh, so and this comes uh, uh, so the whole uh, thing of hierarchy and category uh, category uh, becomes uh, urgent when it's about conflict and intergroup conflict. Uh, so when uh, let's say the Dutch would have a conflict with the Lebanese, uh, it would be us versus you uh, or they, uh, and then then they would be on a distance. And we would be here now. And then how you value us against how you value you or them. Uh, that, that is all what's uh, going on. And it's a core issue in social psychology, of course, where we have been studying um, the, the, the psychological side of conflict. Uh, but then this is never um, uh, uh, researched primarily on location. So where in space is this happening for a person. And um, so my colleague, uh, Walter Utsch, he, uh, he was a uh, professor at the University of Linz. And, uh, and he studied that in uh, political themes. Uh, so and how authoritarian politicians communicate. Mm -hmm. and, and when you have uh, populism, uh, so there's always we against them. And then you can see how easy that's created and how hard it is to get rid of that. Uh, so how hard it is to, to believe that there's one humanity and that we are all part of that. And, um, and things like that are extremely clear in the social panorama. And you, and you can work with that. So when you have a person who, for instance, a person who... Um, is a is a refugee it comes to the Netherlands and then goes to all the steps to become Dutch and then he needs to learn about the history of Holland and the language and then he needs to know a little bit about the laws etc and special cultural habits and so on he can go through all of that but when he still sees the Dutch over there and, and himself and his people here then he will never integrate. And so he needs to, to have the Dutch around him and feeling himself to be with, within that. And then he may not speak the language so well, and he may not share all the cultural values, values but he will be have as integrated as a Dutch because that's his inner image in his social panorama. So would that make the Dutch a container for him in that context, or is it uh, this is completely different? Well, it, it will be that the Dutch, uh, so you could say the we group mm -hmm. for a person is centered around the feeling of me. Okay. Yes, I'm, the feeling of me is inside my body, and my group is around that, so I feel them and I see them around myself. So I'm experiencing my group around me rather than being part of something. Okay. okay. And as long as as the, the Dutch are out there and I have my my own group, uh, let's say, uh, nah, Lebanese or Afghans or, or maybe uh, uh, Americans around me and the Dutch are there, I don't experience to be part of that. So I don't okay. sense belonging. Okay. Okay, back to hierarchies. If I have these two guys and one is looking down on a person, compared, I have this person also looking down. Is there a difference between height and size in hierarchies in a social panorama? If so, what, what is it? Yeah, well, you could say that the uh, social panorama is a simplification of uh, how people create their model of the social world. Mm -hmm. And so in some people's model of the social world, maybe uh, the amount of uh, 
kilograms somebody weighs, uh, whether they are fat uh, and, and massive, uh, plays a role. Uh, but in another, in one person that may mean oh, ugly fat person, I, uh, and in another uh, person's uh, model of the world, it may mean ah, well, he must be rich. It is important because he's so big. And and there's a lot of variation, I think, but the variation is not in the in the level of the eyes, mm -hmm. as they are seen subjectively. Uh, so you could have a. A, a small guy in reality, like um, I, uh, before we had Berlusconi, yeah, so we knew he's not the biggest person in the world. He was a small guy with a big mouth, uh, still. <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, yeah, you you know, there's these guys uh, riding big motorcycles, but are very small. And and they may be rich and influential, and may be dangerous, etc. Uh, so and then other people look up to them, and although they are smaller, and and then they are afraid of them, and they see them higher, uh, in a higher in hierarchy than themselves. So they tend to obey to them or or avoid them because they are afraid of what they may ask from them. So if we're thinking submodality wise, one is size and one is location. So the combination of these two criteria is plays a major role in how I perceive something in my social experience. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that uh, the 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 differences in submodalities in the social model of the world are uh, huge, probably, and, and cultural. But then uh, the general. Uh, Principles of location, like distance and height, and and whether somebody is seen in front or at the sides or at the back, and that's more universal. Okay, okay. So the more uh, detailed submodalities, like if it's a movie or a picture, if it's focused or defocused, do they play a role in in social panoramas, or they are less important? Well. I, what I said, it's a simplification, so we don't look at them. Okay. But with a particular client, you may look at them. Okay. And when when a client starts to to repeatedly tell, yeah, but I see him defocused or so. Okay. You may pay attention to that, uh, but uh, but that's done just uh, submodality. So in, in the regular conversation, I might be watching the news and I go and I see my friend, I might tell my friend, I don't feel safe these days. Or I might tell my friend, you know, with this, these situations in this country, you don't feel safe anymore. Is it um, a person operating from different positions in the social panorama or what makes a person say I versus you from your perspective and experience? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I... I have not studied that that much, so I know okay. that there's uh, a difference. Uh, so in in NLP, there's people who have more this linguistic view, and that they say, yeah, there's people who always talk about you, and it's in fact about themselves. Uh, so and they generalize to maybe to not make it personal or to involve the other. Uh, so uh, when when I say yeah. I'm not feeling safe in this country anymore, then the other is not involved. But when I say, you are not safe in this country anymore, then the other must uh, look, oh, uh, am I still safe? And so I think these type of differences may be included in uh, how you use these pronouns. Mm -hmm. and, and where I was is that I'm not so specialized in this, but that you could say, it's not particular uh, area for the social panorama, okay. but it could be an area for mental space psychology. Okay. Uh, so that could bring us to mental space psychology because mental space psychology uh, is psychology to, and the social panorama is a toolbox uh, mm -hmm. to simplify the work with people and, and their issues with relationships. Uh, but the mental space psychology is to, uh, a general view on how um, yeah, people mentally function, okay. where uh, you could contrast mental space psychology to psychology that's um, looking at behavior, like behaviorism, 
And at the core of the theories is always what is the behavior or more linguistically oriented uh, psychology where everything is thought of as something that is expressed in language. Uh, so then the psychologists are writing and talking and they do not look that much in at nonverbal behavior, mm -hmm. but they look more or listen to what people say about it and they may neglect nonverbal things. So, uh, so uh, and, and imaginary things when they're not expressed in language, etc. Now, in contrast to other paradigms in psychology, you could say that uh, mental space psychology prioritizes space. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what we say is that everything that's going on in the mind goes on somewhere. And so it's, it's either in our body or here in the mind in front of us or both feeling image or I hear something, but it's always somewhere. Now, this, this is not so new because uh, some other NLPers have recognized that uh, superdality um, location is always involved in any uh, experience. So it's not that, uh, that, it's, uh, that I was the first one to recognize it. But I was, by overviewing that, I thought the missing link between NLP, where, where something like this uh, location uh, th this uh, awareness of location is practiced and is used and is discussed and regular psychology is that this is missing there mm -hmm. and when we would prioritize space and how we project our thoughts in space in psychology the, the link to NLP would be very easy because we use it all the time yes that's true <clears throat> an example when, when I teach uh, pr practitioners uh, and I tell them about goals, then probably I, I show when I demonstrate setting a goal, uh, I, I will not do it this way. Okay, what is your goal? What do you want to achieve? And so th that's not the way we do it. And we will probably do it with the client, uh, sign somewhere in space and say, and then probably in uh, where we believe that uh, 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 visual construct is located for them. So what do you want and how would it look like? Uh, so, mm -hmm. And when you have achieved that, what will that mean for your life? And so and we have this hand pointing in space and to a direction where we expect it's easy for the client to start to imagine it, imagine uh, future events and to construct something that they want. So in which direction they might want be, to be going or the steps they're taking to, to get there. Yeah, right. Now, and that's that's one of the uses of space in NLP. The other is that we use this uh, with anchors on the floor. And sure. that, that I think in the, the practice of, um, of NLP training, uh, especially when the groups grew bigger, then the trainers needed a more um, extended uh, show, <laughs> you could say. And so they needed to do something that's more uh, dramatic. And, and then they started to use the, do, for instance, change person history, not on a seat, but on the timeline, yes. so that everybody could see now the client is in the present and now he's walking back in time and he goes to where the trauma was or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then we found out, uh, and, and, and everybody who used it found out that it was enormously supporting the process so that when you uh, were looking at somebody who tried to do change personal history on a seat compared to somebody who used it on a timeline, that the amount of words they need to use and how they need to motivate and um, uh, uh, explain things to the client, that reduced a lot. So when, when they did it on the timeline, the client may say, oh, yeah, here's the now, that's my birth. Okay, yeah, there it happened. Yeah, so that they already taken over the, the process and then uh, what should I do there? And then we say, oh, stay where you are and look at it. Yeah, so, But then uh, you, you see demonstrated that, um, that creating this space, spatial representation of where we work at, 
mm-hmm. that that uh, orients ourselves and and the client and uh, and that makes things happen. So that's what uh, uh, James Lawley, the founder of uh, Clean Space, then had the, so. Uh, so the more space, the less words. Yeah, I think there was a shift between uh, clean language, which was a very, very linguistic, uh, with some aspects of space, to clean spaces which spread things in different places, where do you start, what's next, how are they connected together, what are the relationships. And... Yeah, that's extremely interesting. So I, I know James Lowley and Penny uh, not pretty well, yeah. So don't see them every day, but uh, we saw each other, and we had uh, a couple of nice experiences uh, together. And then we could discuss all these things. And and my reflection on uh, so that David Grove first in uh, developed clean language, and then he developed clean space. That the connection between the one and the two seems to be logical and automatic, mm-hmm. and maybe he used also clean language questions within his clean space work. Mm-hmm. But to me, when I started to um, uh, learn uh, clean space, and I saw uh, Penny and James demonstrated, I think in two thousand three in England somewhere. Uh, that I uh, st- thought, okay, I need to uh, play with this. Uh, and slowly, uh, I didn't need to talk much about that anymore. So so then my version of clean space became much cleaner because I used clean space without knowing anything about the issue, mm-hmm. uh, which is similar often to what James does. But... But then also, I only need to to bring the client to where they get stuck again, and then find a new space to move on. And and, uh, and what was one of my uh, the nicest moments in the cooperation with James Lowley was that we were both in Australia. Uh, I had visiting their uh, two day trainings, and he came one day to my training, and there he experimented with my version of clean space. <laughs> and he came to the conclusion, yes, it also works. Now, I, I, I must say that there's not a competition in that or, or anything, but it was more that uh, we could uh, more focus on on the core uh, elements that make uh, these uh, procedures effective. Uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, so uh, moving to other uh, angles and seeing... Uh, getting uh, away from where you were stuck, moving into a new part, you could say, or a new context where you have maybe more resources, uh, which is uh, in many NLP uh, formats they're in, uh, inside of that. Uh, in, uh, in, I think in the new code of uh, Grinder, there are also very simple exercises where you are stuck and then you move to somewhere else where you're not stuck. Mm-hmm. And I think there's many examples of that. There is a video of James doing a demo of clean spaces on your YouTube channel, Count of Montecinto, right? You've shared that in an empty room and how to do that. So if somebody wants to check it out, they can go to your YouTube channel and watch that. Right. Yeah, I think that's a, a clear demonstration. Uh, so I, I, did the, I did the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> You seem to love love cameras and love recording things and everything. Is there a thing that's like the, your artistic side or is it something that you've learned because you need it in the kind of work that you do? Yeah, it's it's both. It's okay. it's uh, so that I uh, love filming and photography just as a no, passion mm-hmm. and and that's related to my my artistic sides. But then also. Uh, because I'm familiar with people like James Lawley and and uh, Andrew Austin or so, I I have access to to areas uh, and and I understand how to bring it about in my opinion and uh, to make it visible in a way that other uh, filmmakers will have a hard time. Uh, okay. So uh, so I thought uh, now when I'm filming, uh, what's the what's the niche? <laughs> where I can film and nobody else can. 
Okay. Okay. There's always the theme of nature or the theme of climbing a mountain or there's always interesting themes in the videos and documentaries that you do. Is yeah. what, what was the motivator for you to do the documentary about different perspectives of NLP? Yeah, so that was, um, in that time I was uh, traveling a lot. And then I thought, um, yeah, I can uh, do both things. So interview the trainers and the people that I meet uh, and th that I have good relations with. So that are not so maybe not so open to other people, and then I can do it in an informal way, and just um, uh, speak to them. And then I have a couple of questions. So, how is it in your country? What? How do you see the future? What's the? Yeah, what did you expect or so, or what does it do for yourself? Mm -hmm. And then I I just started to collect these movies uh, when I was traveling around and meeting these people and. Uh, and then I thought, oh, this is a nice uh, historical document. And I still think, because it already dates from, I think, 2006 or so. Uh, so it's really, you see uh, people that now look much older. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> But really, thanks for that. It's that it, when I watched it, it broadened my perspective and allowed me to notice like the different people, what are they doing, their different perspectives, and just the flexibility, because sometimes when somebody studies NLP they're just focused on the school that they studied from because that's the perspective there when somebody starts studying NLP but from that there's like a, an open perspective uh, that's the present with you that's also was present with Steve Andreas that shows what different people are doing so thank you for that yeah well thank you for thanking me yeah I I'm always happy when somebody watches my f movies because uh, it's often a lot of work and then uh, and then okay. I look on YouTube and I see, oh, 10 clicks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not many. Maybe they were all mine. <laughs> uh, going back to David Grove, I think I'm not sure if this story I have is correct or not. When he discovered the different positions of I or me or whatever, he was coming on a boat trip and he rented a container and he was noticing the difference between these things. Um there's also the work of Connie Ray Andreas, the wholeness work, which where there's there's this also this different positioning. There's the work of Robert Diltz, the, he calls it the score model, which is the symptom and uh, that it's it's spread over time, uh, which is also space. So when you mentioned once before, I heard you say that this was taken as a, like the insight that started with Steve Andreas about timelines and then timeline therapy and the basis of personality with uh, Tad James and White Woodsmall. So you took that basic timeline and expanded upon it what could be done or what was your thinking when you went more into the relation between space and time? Um, it's hard to reflect on that, uh, but I, I was always curious uh, if there was any novelty in NLP. Mm -hmm. And then what you see is that, uh, and that happened also to me with the Swiss Panorama, that you get uh, canonization. Uh, so that uh, when you develop a model, uh, then you start to believe that this is the model and you want people to do it in the right way. And uh, and so you start to believe that there's only one way. <laughs> and so and that's, that's and, and of course, the models are, are, are often very good. Uh, and then... Uh, so you, then you are a sort of prisoner of your own uh, invention. Uh, and that's also because of the structure of NLP, because uh, there's yeah no uh, regular debate. Uh, so it was not so easy to to discuss with um, for, with Wyatt Woodsball or about the timeline or with uh, Condi Ray about the wholeness process. And so, uh, and, and there's many more examples that, that it was invented that way. And when you come to the, the, the me, uh, self, and you, of um, like that's in clean language and in. Uh, I uh, am too, with, with Andy's work. Yeah, in and Andrew's work. And so then it's different from how my idea about the self uh, is. And. Um, 
No, and I see that my own model as a superior model. <laughs> <laughs> it's above <laughs> them all. It, it has a higher hierarchy. No, but but it was my my model of the self came from uh, just thinking when the when we represent um, uh, all people, all social things in space, so the social panorama. But relationships are always the combination of me and the other. And so, and that's already in social psychology, an uh, old theme, and uh, that that we cannot think of somebody else without thinking about ourselves. And so we are the thinker. And when we evaluate somebody, it's maybe in comparison to ourselves or, or uh, there's always me included. And, and, and because the others were spatial, uh, so then I thought, how can the self be also spatial? And then I started to explore that. And, um, and then I found, of course, that people are talking about... Um, yeah, the, the, the feelings, my feeling of self or my core or so. And, uh, and then when you also look in literature and how people deal with that in other cultures, uh, there must be something that tells the person where they are in the universe. Mm -hmm. and th this, this knowledge uh, is very fundamental and it's so fundamental that it's overlooked and not discussed so often. But uh, I thought, yeah, but when I don't know where I'm located, so when I lose my sense of location, I'm lost. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, and then I start to hear people telling, yeah, when that happens, I lose myself. Mm -hmm. Or I'm lost. Uh, so that, that it seems also to be happening. Now, and then the other thing is that uh, how does a person know how to behave uh, according to what's ex expected from them in the context. Mm -hmm. So uh, they need information. Now, uh, when when we would meet on the street uh, and we haven't seen each other for a long time, uh, so maybe you, you travel to Amsterdam and uh, now I walk there and then uh, and then you say, hi, you are Lucas. Uh, so, and I, <laughs> who is that? A bearded man. <laughs> uh, so and then, uh, but then uh, with a, with a few uh, clues. Uh, so I will need to know. Ah, it's Ronnie. Uh, so uh, and then uh, and then also what I need to know is what's my relationship to you, uh, so that that uh, so that I can continue in a way that's uh, uh, that makes it predictable and now and when you think about that then you see that we must have a way of um, instantly uh, recognizing the person and then uh, getting to where they are in my social panorama so that I can build the here am I and there are you type of relation where we have the expectancy of what was going to happen. But beside that, I need to have an idea about me. Uh, so who am I in the relationship to you? And, and, and this is, uh, I think, very fundamental. And then I came to, okay, there must be an image or, or imagery or a repertory of images that people use to know who they are. Uh, as an NLP, you come to that thought. Now, and then my conclusion after trying it out is that the, that the, the standard structure is that I have a feeling that is connected by some yeah, line of thought, imaginary mm -hmm. line, to an image. And that when there's not that line, this image is not my actual self-image. So, oh, okay. so that by having this connection, you can say that uh, the mixture of association and dissociation, where I'm associated in the feeling and dissociated in the image, and, and this is the special uh, case of uh, the self-construct. Okay. Now, and from there, yeah, from exploring that, I came to many exceptions that people use to know who they are. And, and the most extreme exceptions tend to go together with uh, weird selves and, uh, and difficulties in social life. And um, You crazy. mentioned these in your book, uh, Mental Space Psychology, and I think in the Vimeo training, the uh, misconceptions in psychotherapy, uh, if I'm correct, that's right. Yeah. 
and it's it's always there because I think um, it's a major part of my uh, uh, mission <laughs> to to uh, uh, so of the of the of the words that needs to go out because uh, I think this is so fundamental and when you start using it so that's and I, I'm using it already 25 years this idea about the self and and that opened the whole world of understanding and also of uh, possible interventions okay Going back to your example, if we meet on the street and you, I say hello and you see me. Back a few, a few years back, I was with my father at an event and there were the people who are, uh, they welcome people into the event. And the, uh, one of the people that welcomed us knew me and she was like, okay, hi, Ronnie, how are you? Uh, let, uh, and she took us to our place. Till today, I have no idea who that person is. She doesn't exist in my mental space. And I often go back and like, who was this person and how did she know me? Because she was talking to me in a very uh, familiar way. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not like she had the name. She just knew me when she looked at me. And today, it's very weird for me because she's yeah. very out of my mental space. Um, there's the... Um, the mental MSD, the Mental Spatial Diagnostic Book 1, um is it uh like a guide for people to understand how the brain functions or is it more something else well it was um so um um uh, michiel brandt who's the the president of the society for mental space psychology he ordered me to do something with diagnosis. <laughs> so, and, and I love that because uh, I, I can be uh, uh, dreaming about things for a long time. And then when somebody pushes me a little bit, then uh, then I may jump into action. And that happened here too. Mm -hmm. um, now, my whole idea about uh, mental spatial diagnosis was that, um, that I was already using that for a long time and the best part was then in the self as so what i just was explaining but uh, the, the most clear clearest part but also there exists already the 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 different types of timelines for instance in nlp had they existed already from the 80s and and you could say these are also for the type of diagnosis so that that for instance when we when somebody has the future straight in front of them or at the side makes a difference i'm gonna how... interrupt you here for a second i'm sorry there there is no like i think this was the closest book that explores like the size the distance if it's coming from the upper side or the lower side no other book ever explored that i only think uh andy austin uh, talked about it a bit in one of his youtube videos but that was the first time i see this kind of exploration right but to me it was very meaningful and uh, I think that uh, working with the personal timeline uh, can be much more expounded in NLP. Uh, so the, all the knowledge is there, but uh, I think it's not trained that much. I don't know, but um, you it's could probably that, not. It's probably no. not. <laughs> yeah, but it's but how you represent the past, the present, and the future is deciding largely about your personality. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes you a certain person. There's a certain view on the future, what's possible, and and whether you're driven towards it or, uh, and now yeah, how more how how um, present you are in the presence, yeah, so, and then uh, if whether you are connected to the past or not. So these things are are all in there. I'm now, gonna share something. Sorry to interrupt again. I was working once with a client, and I was exploring the timeline, and the timeline was. Uh, he had it hooked inside his head. The past was over here and the future is behind him. So by that alone, uh, understanding how he was experiencing time, it was very helpful just to deconstruct how he's attached to the past in what way and has turned his back on his future. Yeah, beautiful example and then you accept uh, often immediately understand their type of craziness and so why they have these issues that they come 
over to uh, you for. Uh, and, um, and so I think this is, you could say, diagnosis. So you could say there's a category of diagnosis where clients may have the future behind them uh, and the past in front of them. And what type of personality will that be? Yeah, so, and um, oh yeah, many other examples of that I collected. And then I thought uh, I, I must make a book out of that because it, we need an alternative to the um, symptom-based uh, yeah, DSM type of uh, diagnosis. Was it the on purpose, like DSM, MSD, it's like the opposite? Well, it, it came together very well, but it, I must say that I recognized it when I had written it down. <laughs> so, hey, it's the same letters, uh, but then in the other order. And, uh, and so I, I thought it could be very provocative, and, but I'm also um, uh, not so uh, expecting that much of these things. So then I think, yeah, it's extremely provocative, but the people that need to be provoked is that they will never look at it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but in, but it's, an, it's the only alternative that I know to um, symptom-based diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you have two programs on Vimeo. One is called Mental Space Atlas, and the other is called Misconceptions in Psychotherapy. So, um, can anybody learn them? And if somebody is going to watch them, is it the two? What will they get out of each? Like in a very quick summary. Yeah. So I think Mental Space Atlas is uh, the first one that I made as a online or or a video course. And then I try to explain uh, mental space psychology, how I uh, saw that at that moment, and it's already maybe five years ago or six years ago. And then just to teach that, as I thought, well, if you are interested in this, it has this history, it has this uh, theoretical connections, and it has these applications. And so, and then... Uh, I took the time for that. And so it's it's a long, uh, when you all watch all the videos, now you need to uh, be uh, resistant or you need to have, uh, you need to listen to me all the time in my broken Dutch English and uh, so <laughs> But I thought the people who inter are interested in this, uh, they will get a lot of uh, out of that. And then later, and that was in the beginning of uh, Corona. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, what I want to make is um, uh, an, an sort of uh, uh, video or videos that uh, make it clear for psychologists, especially in fact for psychologists, what steps you need to take to get where I am. As was arrogant, but uh, yeah, you, you need to start somewhere. Uh, but I, I, I found that I had to um, change certain theories that I had learned as a psychologist at university, and that were, yeah, that very, very obvious that everybody, of course, and so that's the case. And these, uh, some of these theories, I I needed to to turn around or to to drop it uh, altogether or take another one for that to get to mental space psychology. Okay. So that's that's the meaning of that. So and the one was so mental space atlas is more okay when you are already open for mental space psychology. Well, this is the things where you can look at and where you can see that. And then the, the uh, uh, misleading theories is in fact, yeah, how are you trained as a psychologist in such a way that mental space psychology is far away from you? or that you will not so easily get into that because it's out of your paradigm, out of your frame. What I really love about your work and the work of uh, Andrew Austin is you always challenge the status quo. I mean, in that, you explain different theories of the brain, how different psychologies think differently about how people evolve and change. And even in the book, The Mental Space Psychology, you talk about like uh, constellation work and the, the similarity with this kind of work and the wholeness work, how it's, there is like a very, very small percentage that shows this very specific evidence-based comparison on what works, what doesn't, and why this works here and why this works here. 
and why it's different for different people. Um, do we understand you that you say that there's little evidence based, uh, but a lot of theoretical discussion or? Uh... No, there is lots of evidence because there's theoretical discussion and there's the percentage of like, I did this with like 500 clients. And uh, so that's rare. That's why it was very helpful to see. Okay, so if I'm going to think of this, this is the usefulness of it. So uh, yeah, nobody so, in the world has done that actually. Yeah, so I think that that's the, the whole problem when you have something as progressive as NLP was in the 1980s, 70s, uh, uh, and where uh, now, uh, thousands of people were successful doing that, and where you had psychology that uh, that was still looking for what are the facts and how can you prove this? And uh, I don't do one step if it's not statistically proven. And, uh, and then also see the, the impotence of uh, NLPers when it comes to prove it, because uh, yeah, they had a whole toolbox uh, with all kinds of uh, things that you could do. And they were not all connected to theories or to experiments. And so everybody that I know that were, uh, had a psychological background and did NLP had the idea, yeah, what we do here, uh, there's no discrepancy between what uh, our colleagues in academic psychology find and what we do <laughs> so, and what we practice. And this, this, it's about all the same mind. And so we're not, not uh, working with another brain than they do. And so it's all the same. So there must be a big uh, overlap and matching between the two things. But then uh, uh, finding these connections, or uh, I think Richard Ballstead has uh, spent a lot of time in finding all these links uh, in, the, in the 90s and beginning of the 2000s. But, um, but then still, there's such a cultural divide. Uh, so that, that's, uh, when I, I often think that when I, would have been uh, a psychologist that was not an artist, mm -hmm. then I probably would have rejected NLP altogether. <laughs> because I was raised as an artist, and, and as an artist, you were always looking for the, for the avant-garde, for the newest things and for the extreme new things. And so and that's how I found NLP. And I thought, ah, this is the hottest thing in town eh, in, 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 in uh, psychology. So when I take myself serious as a psychologist, I need to do NLP, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was not shared by many of my colleagues. Uh, so. yeah. uh, unfortunately, NLP is losing a bit of its progressiveness because now there's the right way to do it in many different schools. But there are people like you like Andy, like Nick Kemp, uh, like Richard Bolstad, who are being progressive in different directions, which is very, very useful. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that's, uh, that, that uh, there's always in every movement, uh, so there's a consolidation. Uh, so and yeah, every religion and every um, area of science that, that, uh, that then there's this thick books that tell how things are and the authors of these books are often old professors or old theologians or old um, now yeah, people who have studied all the books and so on and that uh, takes care of that uh, things are more consolidated in in a certain way and then um, people who are progressive or try to develop it some more and they um, yeah, are often stared upon from why, why it's good enough. <laughs> I have two last questions. The first one is, from your perspective and experience, if somebody wants to understand how the brain functions, is it studying different schools and then connecting the dots? Or is it like um, focusing on one path and seeing if that actually has evidence? Well, the first thing, yeah, so I think that... Uh, uh, there's a, a nice book. I don't know the name of the author at the moment, but it's called um, Irreducible Mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a thick book and it's uh, 
uh, tells a story of psychology as as psychologists always try to reduce the complexity of the mind and so to, to simplify it so to make uh, something that's so complex as human behavior and the mind etc to something simple that you can calculate and uh, that you can sell etc program uh, uh, like the different ingredients different programs like them it's different metaphors for different people that's true yeah and, and so and that resulted in in several schools in psychology now when you when you want to understand the the mind i think that um, uh, the, for instance the the technology of uh, neuroimaging has yeah, so brain scans uh, that is very fascinating. It's high tech. There's money for that. Uh, people are impressed with the beautiful images, and and then this became the thing. And so now it seems that um, when we do a certain NLP um, technique with a person, that it only is proven when somebody would have done scans, uh, brain scans with the client before and That's after. Good. Yeah. And, and that is then the definitive proof that it works. Uh, but that's crazy, of course, because the, the brain scans are not so precise. And um, There could be change in behavior, but still having the same result in the brain, the same brain activity, but it's different, like, actions, yeah. outcome. Yeah, so, so you need, also, although brain scans have learned this a lot, uh, we still uh, see that as not the final word on, on how the mind works. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I argue that you need to, um, to look <coughs> in the space around the brain, in mental space, mm -hmm. and also in the brain. Uh, and yeah. you could say that, that, that uh, now the paradigm is looking in at where in the brain is something happening when a certain uh, phenomenon is uh, seen or a certain uh, psychological task is done. But you also need to look at where in the mental space are these things projected and, and how can people report about what they then see in their mental space happening. And of course, this asks them, uh, the clients to close their eyes and witness their imagination. Mm -hmm. And so then imagination uh, needs to be uh, considered as a legitimate uh, data in psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot calculate that that easily. And uh, as uh, the, the results of the scans uh, roll out of the computer. Uh, so, but uh, results of asking a person, and where do you see that? And where did it move? Yeah. That's, That's direct thing. feedback. That's direct feedback. I think what lots of people miss in the um, map versus territory thing, so the map and the territory, that there is what's happening inside, what's happening outside, and in the map, you have the geological map, you have the, uh, for example, the greenery map, you have the road map, you have the train map. So all of these together create the actual territory, and just by giving, like, paying attention to different parts which could not go inside and the same map could also be, be very helpful to give you the total bigger image of things. Right, yeah. I, I think that's, that's, um, that's to me, that's science when you are not specializing in only one small paradigm with one trick of the trade where you have a, a way to measure a phenomenon and then do that for the rest of your life. And so, uh, yeah, you need to uh, try to have all the angles available to understand the world <laughs> yeah. i mean that's this has its uses in places that are like let's uh, call them closed systems which the, the criteria are very finite and measurement of things but in something like the brain where there is lots of connections lots of things going on confining it to very very defined criteria all the time could be helpful in specific instances but in other instances it's not my last question, um, I've, se I've seen uh, videos on YouTube of you, Andrew Austin, Nick Camp, uh, Richard Bolstad, giving trainings in uh, Colorado in, in, with Steve Andreas's uh, NLP Comprehensive. Uh, was it a coincidence that you all met over there or was it something that... No. Was, what, was the, what was that about? Well, 
I, I, one of the people that I admired a lot and still admire, but he's gone now, is Steve Andreas. He was sort of the conscience of MLP. He never, uh, uh, well, he was polite, but uh, he said everything he considered to be that needs to be said. Uh, so I, and, um, and then, so, and, and also uh, Connie Ray, of course, uh, on his side is a very ethical person, a really uh, a very lovely person. So I, I love both of them. And I saw them as, um, as the, the people in NLP that uh, were, uh, yeah, how, how do you call it? So they, they had not do, done anything wrong yet <laughs> <laughs> but most of the other NLPers they had yeah some things in their life or they try to control NLP or make money on it in another way than uh, by training or selling books or and so you you could see that that they were uh, to me uh, were brilliant people and had, they had contributed a lot to NLP that's and then uh, they were also exploring uh, what's happening in the world of NLP. And so I got an invitation uh, for Boulder, just like Andrew and I think uh, Nick Kemp and uh, uh, Richard Ballstead. And so the, because they were just exploring uh, who are here, the people who try to renew things. Now, I think to Steve Andreas, there was never something really new because probably he had the idea that I've done it all. <laughs> <laughs> I think but, his background as a scientist was like he wanted things to be done in a specific way. And his version of evidence was show me what works and show me why it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at least uh, so I, I came over to Boulder and, and it was one of my best experiences in my career because I had to stay there for two weeks in the house of Stephen Connery, uh, because my other training in the US didn't take place. So I had to wait for my flight back. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they lived in a marvelous uh, home in a beautiful area. And so I could do cycling and uh, walks. And, uh, and I was also befriended with uh, uh, the son of Steve and uh, Mark. Mark. Yeah, so it was very nice to be there. And it was also a dream come true because I, uh, that's a story, I don't know whether that still fits in, but uh, when I, I think in the, in 1998 or so, mm -hmm. I was traveling in the United States with my girlfriend. And then we traveled uh, to the southern United States and then we uh, saw that we could travel to Moab, Utah. And uh, Moab, Utah was... Uh, uh, the the location where officially the publishing house Real People Press was located, and maybe you've seen it, uh, Real People Press, Moab, Utah, USA. Now and then, so we wanted to see Real People Press, and we drove to Moab, Utah, and it's a sort of western city where there's only homes of one story high, and then we found out that in Main Street there was. Real People Press, and then we came, and it was a shop window, and you could read among, among many other companies, the, the, the name of Real People Press is also there. Mm -hmm. now, so uh, my girlfriend, she telephoned, there was a telephone booth on, uh, nearby, she, she telephoned the lady who belonged there, and she said, yeah, we want to visit Real People Press, and um, she said, there's nothing here, mm -hmm. so it's only <laughs> a mailbox. Now, so I was frustrated, and I know another person, a, a German, who was uh, tried to same, tried the same thing, and also was frustrated about that. And then, when I was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, in the home of uh, Stephen Connery, I could sleep there. I, I had a sleeping room, and when I woke up, I went out my bedroom, and then I walked through the office of real people press <laughs> and all the books were there and that fulfilled my frustration <laughs> amazing story amazing thank you so so much for your time i really appreciate it and for your sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience about all that we talked about 
Well, Roni, I hope to see you more often uh, in many other contexts. You so, will definitely, uh, definitely in the upcoming trainings this year, I will be there and you will definitely see more of me. See you next time. Bye. Bye.